Meet a local woman who faced a scary battle against cervical cancer. It used to be one of the most common causes of cancer death for American women. Coming up on today's Morning Medical Update, why she says time played such a key role in her recovery. Good morning. It is Friday, January 20th. I'm Jessica Lovell. Welcome to the Morning Medical Update. Cervical cancer is one of the most preventable and treatable forms of cancer, thanks to prevention and screening. Today, we're going to hear from a patient about her treatment and the current research and trials that could change the future of cervical cancer. Make sure you get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to all of those right there on your screen. In 2023, there are expected to be nearly 14,000 new cases of cervical cancer. That's about 200 fewer cases than last year. A study from the American Cancer Society found women ages 20 to 24 who were the first to receive the human papillomavirus uh, vaccine showed a 65 percent reduction in cervical cancer from 2012 to 2019. The HPV vaccine was first given back in 2006 to females ages 9 to 26. We know that's changed. We'll talk about that in a bit. HPV causes more than 90% of all cervical cancers. We'll talk about that as well. But first, I want to welcome our guest. Aaron Reyes is with us today. Um, and it is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, so we're so happy you're here and you're going to share your story with us. Um, Aaron was treated here for cervical cancer at the health system back in 2021, and we're joined also by her physician, Dr. Lori Spuzak, uh, her surgical oncologist. How are you? Good morning. Always glad to have you with us. And um, you're your passion towards women's health is always um always shines through and comes through. So I'm very glad you're here to talk about this. My pleasure to be here. Um, so let's talk about this, Erin. When were you first diagnosed? When uh when were you first diagnosed and then what were those initial symptoms that you experienced? I think are you on mute, Erin? Okay. Yeah. No. Okay, now let's go. I think we can hear you okay, now. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. No, sorry, I was um, first diagnosed back in March of 2021, and just symptoms um, included, I started having a, a gush of clear liquid, and um, and then what mostly scared us was bleeding uh, during intercourse, um, and it was, it was very scary for both me and my husband. <laughs> That would be really concerning. And I appreciate you just being really candid about those symptoms because a lot of people yeah. don't always want to talk about that, but it's right. simply the reality. And, mm -hmm. and I would imagine, Dr. Suzak, the symptoms can present in different ways and that seems really severe. Um, so this is happening. Um, you clearly know something's wrong. Um, when did you reach right. out and, and try to get some answers on what was going on? Well, I started to, we have when my husband, he was like, you know, something's definitely not right. We got it. You got to go. I went to my PCP and that's when she saw um, like a bubble gum size uh, lesion in my, around my cervix or in my vagina. So. Mm -hmm. We've got them. It's okay to talk about it. And I know it's not comfortable, but thank you. And this is I'm why we're so have appreciative that you're here to talk about it and be honest and candid. Thank you so much. We're so grateful because so many, Absolutely. so many women are afraid of talking about their body. And so I just have so much uh, gratitude for you that you're willing Absolutely. to share. Yeah. And, and we do, you. and that's why we do this show, but we, we can't do this program without patients that are willing to share their stories and yeah. be open so that other yeah. women see this, Erin, yeah. and then go, right. wow, that's happening to me. Yeah. So it, it's life changing and it's life saving. So, so yes, thank you. Um, I do want to ask you though, Dr. Yeah. Spuzak, you know, she was talking about these severe symptoms she was having. Yeah. What other symptoms might someone be having right now that might be well, worth a phone call to your doctor. Yeah, sure. I think abnormal bleeding, like Erin said, um, any type of abnormal discharge, pelvic pain, uh, anything that is sort of atypical for you. But the truth is a lot of cervical cancer is actually silent. And the mm -hmm. best way to find out what's going on or, or a pre-cancer a pre of the cervix is actually through screening. So a regular mm -hmm. pelvic exam, um, pap smear on schedule per guidelines, um, which can change based on your age, um, but 
um, but many times it's actually caught through the process of screening. Okay, yeah. you, you say cervical cancer is a slow progressing cancer. What do you mean by that? Well, so what I mean is actually, so it's slow to, to turn into cancer. So the reason, reason that screening works really well for cervical cancer prevention is that pre-cancer has a protracted course. It takes time to evolve into a cancer. And so that is why uh, the pap smear technology is, um, is so effective because over the course of your life, it can catch early changes and then, um, and then uh, you are able to get further diagnostic workup and then treatment, hopefully before it turns into cancer. I will share though that there are some types that are very hard to detect and some, especially on the inside of the cervix, there's cer cervical cancers sort of that start on the outside and then there's ones that start on the inside. And those endocervical cancers sometimes can be a little harder to pick up on pap smear. Um, and, um, and so now we've added, uh, for those who are above the age of 30 HPV testing as well to complement um, that um, the cellular testing that we do through a pap smear and that can really help us also with um, detecting cancers. All right, so I've been getting pap since I was 18. You, yeah. you get them, every, you, you would get them annually back in the day. Last one I had, it was now you need it every five years. I went, wait, hold up, five years? Right. I thought it was every year. Well, so that concerned me. <laughs> yes. So tell us about that and yeah. we, what, what so, those changes mean. So pap smear uh, testing has changed a lot. And mm -hmm. basically they're trying to balance reducing sort of unnecessary testing, but also balance that with the rates and risk of cervical cancer. And so, um, and so for example, we typically start testing at 21 now, but we don't start HPV testing until your 30s, depending on which testing algorithm you use. Sometimes people start with HPV testing only at age 25. So there's different there's different algorithms that people use for testing and they've changed over time. So if you have negative co-testing, meaning you have a negative cellular test okay. um, plus a negative HPV, then yes, for your age group, you can expand your actual swab test every five years. Should you still see a GYN for a bunch of other reasons, maybe once a year? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and it's just like how we talk about, you know, any kind of preventive care. Um, should you still see your primary care doctor? Um, yes. And even, so it is much better to catch things early before things happen, to talk about prevention, to talk about um, prevention options than uh, to catch things late, right? And so, yeah, so yeah. it's been a minute since yeah. I was 18. So yeah. what you're saying is yeah. things have advanced and <laughs> changed, have changed since way, yeah. way back then. We have more information. That's yeah. right. Erin, yeah. were you getting your regular pap smears though um, since you yes. were young and this was something that was always on your schedule and your calendar? Yes, absolutely. Um, every year I would go to do my yearly physicals and definitely get that taken care of. Yeah. And I, and I think, and I'll just point out, so if, if it's okay to share, um, Aaron's particular type of cancer is the kind that starts inside the cervix. So sometimes we find that um, those are not caught as effectively with the typical swabbing um, pap smears. And so sometimes they present um, uh, and have evaded our, all of our standard screening technologies, yeah. But is it mm -hmm. her specific type of cervical cancer mm -hmm. that may have caused some of those extreme symptoms? symptoms sure. The bleeding, oh, yeah. of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to talk about the treatment, her sure. treatment plan and your path. Um, I'll, doc, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Spuzak, I'll, I'll start with you because okay. she had what's called a radical hysterectomy. So tell us sure. the difference between a standard a simple, hysterectomy. Yeah, a simple hysterectomy versus a radical hysterectomy. So. Um, so when cervical cancer is caught early enough, meaning it hasn't extended out laterally, um, which it usually does, so it can spread into the vagina and into the tissues around the cervix, some folks are candidates for a radical hysterectomy. Um, so usually when we do surgery, it sort of hugs the uterus and cervix for a simple hysterectomy. When you have a radical hysterectomy, um, we need to take a portion of the vagina and all of the tissues around the cervix and the lymph nodes of the pelvis. And, it, and, and it's a very high risk surgery. About one in 10 women will have a, a serious complication even in the best hands mm -hmm. because it's such a radical procedure. Um, but it is the best chance for survival for, uh, for 
very special candidates for this type of surgery, which Aaron was one of yep, those you candidates. said it's highly ther yeah. risk, high risk, but highly therapeutic. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the HP vaccine. I have a nine-year-old. My daughter just received hers uh, this past round of vaccinations. And Aaron, you said you've got a nine-year-old. Um, so we we're talking about this a lot with our children, our daughters, and our sons. Dr. Spuzak, though, let's talk about, um, you know, you've been doing um, and treating this cancer. You've mm -hmm. been studying this cancer. Here comes this vaccine. Yeah. Um, you've always said this is the first vaccine that could that could prevent a cancer. cancer. You yes. can never stress that enough. Right. And I mean, which to me is a miracle. Um, and the way that the vaccine first started, um, it only covered a certain, you know, a smaller percentage of the high risk strains. Now it covers um, uh, the the majority of high risk strains, so that this vaccine can potentially um, prevent 99% of cancers if it's um, delivered effectively at the right age and um, before exposures to HPV. So, it's it's truly life changing, and I think that. Um, if folks could just see what I see as far as what cervical cancer looks like and the things that we have to ask our patients to go through, um, uh, that they would definitely want to save their children from having that experience. Um, and I'll also just echo, we've talked about this before, this is not just cervical cancer mm -hmm. prevention, it's mm -hmm. any kind of genital, you know, sort of uh, the, the genital tract, uh, anus, the head and neck cancers. Um, so we're preventing actually a tremendous number of cancers with this uh, HPV vaccine. Um, so, it's, it, so it's a really big deal, yeah. And it felt good um, getting my daughters vac vac vaccinated with yeah. this. I knew this day yeah. would come and it was, it was a good moment to yeah. know you're doing something for their future. Uh, Erin, what, what was that like for you? Talk about, were you vaccinated? I mean, I. You know, I was not. Um, actually, I didn't even know about the vaccine until I started having children of my own. Um, and I, I guess I didn't really, yeah, it was kind of disappointing, you know, how, cause I, I don't think it was available back then, but. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think yeah, it was I mean, available during your, when you right. were a bit, like of age, quote unquote, to get it. Oh. And so you would have been in sort of a catch up group to, to get HPV right. vaccine. So, because who yeah. is in that catch-up group? Because I did well, ask my doctor, is that something yeah. that people need to be getting? I mean, it, can you get it up to age 45? You can, but um, but really we want to emphasize that it, it works the best and mm -hmm. um, there's even more and more research coming out talking about even if, if you get it at a young age, potentially even like a single dose is effective. Um, so. So it's like if you get it at the right age, which is really in that younger mm -hmm. age group, then you can limit the number of vaccines potentially that you need to get administered, and then it has a better effect over time. So a more protective and um, a more a robust immune uh, response with the vaccination the earlier you get it. Sure. And Erin, I want to go back to what you were saying. You're right. I was part of that group, too. It wasn't around when I, when I was that age, but our kids are. So tell me about that and, and knowing what you know and what you've been through. Um, you know, talk to other parents out there about um, about why uh, they should should get this vaccination on the list for their kids. Absolutely. Um, well, so I have an 11 and a 13 year old and a 15 year old boy, and the rest are girls. And I definitely, through this whole experience, okay. I would want them to be safe. And um, you know, you you do the best for your kids, and you want them to be safe. Yeah. What's this been like for you, Erin? Um, talk, talk to us about it. And, and how, I want to know how you're doing, how you're feeling physically. And then oh. just for someone else who's about to embark on this journey themselves, you know, what, what words of wisdom might you have? Well, um, I'm, I'm feeling really great and grateful for Dr. Spuzak. Um, she's been great through this whole process. Um, it's, it's, it's scary. It really is. And I just, early detection is very important. It's um, your yearly screenings. Um, I, I can't express that enough. I'm, I'm glad that I was, I was taught just to every year, just listen to your bodies. And um, I hope, you know, show all the women and the girls, anything with your bodies, you got, you got to go and get it checked. Get it checked. All the girls and all the boys. We want to teach our yes, boys yes. that if there's something going on down Absolutely. there, um, yeah. 
just to say something. You Absolutely. know, we've all got right. one, we've all got them, and yes. let's let's talk about it and and make and feel more comfortable sharing the information. Yeah. Um, has how I, I want to ask you because. Aside from anti-vaxxers, you know, sure. the vaccine had had some controversy in the beginning. Sure. Uh, how have we how have we moved the ball forward with that? And I mean, I I still feel like our country has really fallen behind um, other uh, high and low resource countries, and it is because of stigma associated with vaccination. We saw that during COVID too, um, and it, it's really hard to combat that. Mm -hmm. um, I can I can in my own mind and experience um, I can tell people what I see and and what I do but it's um, but it's but it's a very difficult um, thing to do to combat mis, uh, misinformation and yeah. I want to talk about the we talk about the stigma of the vaccine I want to talk about the stigma of HPV you sure. said if you are a sexually active person yeah that your chances of being exposed or having HPV yeah are almost, huge almost yes. just they it's say, just there right they say sort of lifetime risk for males is 90 percent and for women it's 80 percent if you've ever been sexually active um, why don't more people have cancer? It's because most of our bodies are able to clear HPV and the virus. Um, can we be reinfected? We can. Um, and the other, the other thing that's true is that there are like hundreds and hundreds of strains and it's uh, only a few strains that really lead to the cancers. And so, um, and so most of us in our lifetime will have had HPV. Some folks who, for example, uh, are immunocompromised for some reason, they're on chronic steroids or they have HIV. Um, some folks who are smokers, there are different ways that we decrease our, our body's ability to clear HPV infections. And um, some folks are at higher risk of persistent um, HPV infection and the sort of the, the consequences of those. Yeah. I want to take a quick break. I know you have a big case you're working on this morning, yeah. so we're going to have to wrap up. But okay. I want to get to Dr. Dana Hawkinson, um, get a quick check on our COVID account before we yeah. head into this uh, this weekend. Yeah, we don't necessarily have to take a break. We can talk about vaccines all day. That's right. HPV we'll keep you is busy a, all is morning. a lifesaver yeah. for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. HPV vaccine is a lifesaver for sure. Please. Get yourself up to date with that. Get your children especially um, vaccinated, both men, uh, boys and girls. Very important. Right now, uh, our COVID count, you know, has been really uh, variable the last uh, week or so, 10 days. Right now, 37 active cases in the hospital, eight in the ICU, four on the ventilator, 70 total. But, you know, uh, we, we did dip a little bit in the active cases. We're back up a little bit now to 37. All right, I want to get to a couple headlines. Dr. Yeah. Hawkinson, um, Uganda declares the end of the Ebola outbreak. So mm -hmm. what was the driving force in mm -hmm. stopping those transmissions? What, what do we know at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think this was multifactorial. Number one, the response of the Ugandan government and the healthcare providers. We know this is very easy to transmit when you do have people in the hospital who are encountering those body fluids. Um, but I think it was really those local uh, uh, things that they did, those local interventions to help reduce it. Also getting the word out, getting education. We know education was huge for this because some of these uh, cases occurred in more rural regions. And so there was a lot of stigma about that. There was uh, you know, still using local medicine people for that, but it was education. It was doing the right things locally. And we also know that uh, for this Ebola strain in Uganda, it was uh, Ebola, the Sudan strain. There was no treatment or vaccine for that we know that they did start to roll out some trials of three different vaccines as well hopefully and we are expecting good results from that um, i don't know that that had a big impact because it was just trials but i think uh, we will get some more information for that hopefully moving forward we will have a vaccine or vaccines for ebola sudan but also more importantly it was those local interventions done by everybody on the ground there in uganda all right, next headline, grabbing the attention of infectious disease doctors. The world's oceans yeah. were the warmest on record for the last four years, yeah. four years in a row. So it's certainly a, a sign of climate crisis. Mm -hmm. But how does the temperature of the ocean impact infectious diseases? Yeah, I mean, it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. So it is the temperature of the oceans, but that is a also a, uh, a bellwether for the uh, temperature of, of the climate in general. And we are seeing warmer temperatures now reaching up into those normal, nor, uh, northern climates. Uh, as those, uh, those southern temperatures increase and rise, we know that there are temperature thresholds for certain species, so they will seek uh, different uh, temperatures 
mostly going into those northern latitudes. Um, it's just a lot of different topics right now that all come together to do this as you have different species moving into different areas where they not normally are whether that's vectors like the insects the ticks uh, or whether it's uh, the animals the vertebrates like birds bats you are going to have more uh, contact the ability to contact different animals different vectors like ticks or mosquitoes. Um, and so I think it, it's just a, a variety of factors that all contribute to now overall our increased risk of getting exposure to maybe viruses we haven't seen before or that we have but now are re-emerging for one reason or another. And to Dr. Spuzak's point as well about vaccination, we know uh, that overall vaccination in the current uh, vaccine preventable diseases that we do have will help overall in this because we know and we do anticipate further exposure to, uh, again, re-emerging viruses and, and pathogens that we already know about, but also those ones that we haven't really yet discovered or identified yet as well. So it's definitely a, a complex picture. I mean, we could do a whole hour on that. I know we have to move on with our show, but, <laughs> but it, is, it is truly interesting. And we have to expect more, uh, more identification of diseases or outbreaks as we move forward as well. All right, I'm gonna hold you to that hour program. Yeah. Special, infectious disease special, yeah. all right. Okay, let's get to, uh, uh, well, first, do we have any reporters on the line? Nope, let's get to our community questions, good ones today. Uh, question, Dr. Spuzak, I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask Aaron first, but what if my partner has HPV, how do I protect myself? Mm -hmm. So Aaron, you know, how, what, was the, what were those conversations like when it come, came to your, your spouse? Um, well, he, he was so supportive. Um, he, yeah, was, God, he's been so great. Um, you know, he just was very concerned uh, and he just like, we got to go to your doctor. I was like, I agreed. I was, I definitely agreed. I was like, yes, I, so I hurried up and made my appointment. And, and so, um, yeah, it's, he's just been great. Was there, were there any concerns about him? At, at, him wanting to be screened um was he wanting to check his no. own health to make sure you know that this hadn't advanced for him as well absolutely yes and he did um and every yeah he's fine everything came out came back fine his blood work everything and so he yeah he did because i wanted him to as well so mm -hmm. but yes he did so he Dr. did a, yeah yeah so, so he did a blood test? That, so talk so, to me about that so we yeah. understand. So basically, um, the truth is, it, it's very hard to prevent HPV. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. could you use condoms because as, an, as a sort of sexually transmitted infection uh, context for prevention of HPV in that way? Um, maybe there's some maybe there's some effect and some benefit, but the truth is HPV can infect all of the tissues and skin of yeah you know, of the vagina the vulva the perianal region the oral cavity so so the likelihood is it's hard when you have a long-term relationship or a coupling that you're going to prevent it with condoms so the truth is the best way to prevent hpv is to get vaccinated okay it goes back um, to that and so mm -hmm. and and a phys the physical manifestation of hpv in a male is kind of only going to present if they get um, one of those downstream complications like genital warts or um, some type of cancer you know and so um, there's not a screening regimen or an algorithm for men that I am aware of, mm -hmm. um, unless you're talking mm -hmm. about sort of if, if someone has a known immunocompromised state, sometimes now folks are working on sort of anal pap smear and uh, HPV screening in that way, but that's still very controversial and, um, and it's an evolving form of, uh, of prevention strategy right now. Angie yeah. wants to know, is HPV passed on through and we've talked about this on the show, touching other areas of your body. So Some, you touch any, yeah. any sort of... Uh, intimate contact Intimate contact. So let's yeah. say you touch, mm -hmm. because that's what we do in those intimate situations, but then let's say mm -hmm. you're anything, your hands, you know, if, if something, is, does it travel on hands? It, and I mean, I, it can tra it's travel on uh, body fluids, um, but then also you think, like, warts are <laughs> HPV. So, like, um, how do, e even if you think about your skin, mm -hmm. not, not, uh, sort of genital HPV, but um, like th like it's through contact, Got and, and um, you have some kind of susceptibility, and so you. So can, when you get a wart on your yes. hand, it is a it mm -hmm. is a strain of mm -hmm. HPV. But it's just not the particular you know anogenital. That's going to yeah. lead to a mm -hmm. cancer. Yeah. Okay. 
And well, I have one question came through here about when is the latest that a woman should have? What is the age that a woman no longer needs to have a pap smear? Uh, Kim uh, wants to know. This is actually really a complex question um, that you need to talk to your provider about because it depends on what the results of your last pap smear were. Um, whether or not you've had a hysterectomy for a non-cancer related indication, whether or not um, you've had HPV infection. So there's actually a lot that goes into that. So uh, there are really important algorithms that, um, that are out there from multiple expert groups that tell you that, but it's individualized. So I can't tell you a, a particular age. You have to ask your doctor what your risk factors are and when. Mm -hmm. So give us some good news. What excites you most when it comes to the future of treating this particular cancer? I mean, we can eradicate cervical cancer if the population of young people uh, gets vaccinated, right? So if the uptake of, of, of HPV vaccination was uh, high enough, um, we could potentially eradicate cervical cancer. So there's something to look forward to if uh, our population all got on board with vaccinations. Um, the other things are treatment strategies. Actually, we have have, um, it is the best time, I think, in cancer care. It's like one of the most exciting times to talk about treatment, tailored treatment if you needed chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, actually new drugs for cervical cancer that have come available only in the last literally two years. So it's kind of this, it's an incredible time um, for, uh, for treatment um, and for screening for all uh, different types of cancers and prevention specifically for cervical cancer. All right, I wanna to get to final thoughts for our guests. And Erin, I just wanna give you a moment to share um, your, your thoughts, your words, and your message to anyone who's listening regarding your story. Right. Um again like you can't express it enough just how just early yearly screenings um can early detection can just really save you know like your life your everything <laughs> you know it's just yeah early prevention definitely and when you hear dr suzak say that it could be eradicated at some point that must excite you as well especially when you have have your kids at home and, and looking towards their future right Right, correct. That is very great. That's so great. <laughs> <laughs> I always make her leave us with some really good news. Yeah. So um, again, yeah. I, I, I speak for Dr. Spuzak and myself and everyone here that we just appreciate you so much um, and, and appreciate you sharing and just being open. And, and uh, we just wish you the absolute very best. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here and just spread the word, definitely get vaccinated and everything. I love it. Yes, absolutely. We have to get you on more kayaking trips like we saw in your pictures. <laughs> yes, oh, back to all those. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, <laughs> thank you for thank you for sending those. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was yeah, that was a good trip. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> more kayaking and um, just, you know, get home and be with those kids and, and you have a beautiful family and we just we want you to be well. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you, I really appreciate it. Now I know why you recommended her joining us today. She's lovely. Absolutely. Um, your final <laughs> thoughts today. I mean, my, my final thoughts are get, get yourself, your partner, your kids vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we, I think one thing that we always talk about is like, what, what are the, our fears associated with it? Really, it's, it's the, the, the biggest risk is kind of allergy, like all of the other vaccines that we get. Um, uh, and the the outcome, the benefit is so great. I I wish I always say this. I wish people could see what I see um, every day and how bad this can be. Um, I I only wish you could take a minute in my mind and see all of the things I've seen to know how much we really want to avoid cervical cancer uh, for our loved ones. And so that that's my my takeaway. Is you would love to be put out of work and retire. I, I actually would be so grateful to be put out of work for cervical cancer <laughs> because um, it's possible. It's possible. it's possible. Yeah. Always good to see you. Like I said, you're hard to track down because you're so busy. And we appreciate <laughs> you being here. And I know you got to get yeah. going here in a moment. I want to get a quick final thought yeah. um, from Dr. Hawkinson today. Yeah. Um, how can we do anything but really mm -hmm. piggyback on our guests today and just continue to emphasize the importance of vaccination, uh, the overwhelming safety and efficacy of vaccination for preventing these things, preventing disease, 
reducing disease and also um, preventing mortality, which is so important. Uh, we just have to understand what were things like before the vaccines for whatever we are talking about, whether that's measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, what were those disease states like, whether it's uh, HPV and, and, and cervical cancer, and understand from that view of now the benefits of these vaccines and the overall safety and just continue to endorse that and really try to be proactive in preventing disease for yourself and your loved ones. Doc Hawk, thanks so much and thank you all for being with us today. We'll see you back here Monday morning at 8 a.m. But between now and then, the Kansas City Chiefs kick off their playoff runs. So on this Red Friday, let's share in all the excitement and from everyone here at the health system, go Chiefs. Monday on the morning medical update. The struggle is real as we enter into the high stakes and high emotions of the NFL playoffs. I'm Jessica Lovell coming up Monday on the morning medical update. Our clinical expert and former Chiefs player highlights the physical demands of this intense level of play as our sports psychologist tackles the mental toll. Join us Monday at 8. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.